but I'm sure they will be coming in. So hello, everybody. My name is Helen Downey. I'm the president of Sport Hamilton, and I will be your host for this webinar tonight. It is my honor to welcome everyone to this uh, evening, the second webinar in the Sport Hamilton series, Return to Play in Sport in Hamilton. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the land of the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron, Wendat, Wendat, sorry, Haudenosaunee and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. The purpose of this webinar this evening is to hear from the various experts on our panel who can outline the policies and procedures that, input, that have been put in place in order for Hamiltonians to safely return to a quality physical activity and sport experience at all levels of participation and for all ages. I would like to clarify that we are not here this evening to debate the various vaccine studies or COVID-19 data. The science is clear that vaccines work and save lives. We will hear from our speakers who will present both municipal and provincial perspectives. Once the speakers have completed their presentations, and if time permits, I will ask them a few questions that have been submitted in advance uh, from some of you. If you have any further questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box. The panelists will endeavor to answer uh, some of these if time permits, or we will be able to post the answers to these questions on the webinar, webinar page, along with the webinar recording on the Sport Hamilton website. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our, in, our distinguished panelists and then we can get started. I'd like to welcome Mr. Lachman Nandu and Aaron Fuller from the COVID-19 response team with the Healthy and Safe Communities uh, Public Health Services, Epidemiology, Wellness and Communicable Diseases Control for the City of Hamilton. As well, we will have Dr. Nin Tran, the Associate Medical Officer of Health for the City of Hamilton. At some point, I know he'll be joining us on the, on the webinar and may be able to say a few words or answer any questions for you. From the City of Hamilton, we have Mr. Steve Savor, Manager of Sports Services for Healthy and Safe Communities Recreation Division, as well as uh, Laura, Ms. Laura Kerr, Manager of Program Development, Healthy and Safe Communities uh, Recreation Division as well. Um, and lastly, our third speaker will be Mr. Paul Oslin, Chief Executive Officer with Athletics Ontario, He's a former Canadian Olympic, Commonwealth Games and Pan American Games track athlete. So welcome all of you and thank you for being here this evening. I know you've taken time out of your very busy schedules. So thank you for joining us tonight. And so without further ado, I would ask our first speaker, Latchman and Aaron, and whenever Dr. Tran comes, if he wants to join in, he will join in as well. So take it away, Latchman. Thank you, Helen. I'll begin to share my screen. Perfect. Helen, can you see my screen? Sorry, I muted my... Yes, of course. It's good to go. You look Perfect. Good. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So tonight, we'll start off by talking a little bit about the Reopening Ontario Act requirements for sports and recreation settings, and I'll also discuss um, infection prevention and control recommendations for these settings. So our outline for tonight is to talk about COVID-19 safety plan, to review capacity limits, 
to talk about the use of mask and PPE and eye protection in these settings, uh, review signage and screening requirements based on the ROA, talk about physical distancing, and review environmental cleaning and disinfection recommendations. So <clears throat> let's start first by talking about proof of vaccination status. This is um, a requirement that's in effect today, where the Ontario government will require proof of vaccination status for people to access higher risk public settings. Um, so we'll include facilities used for sports, and fitness activities, and personal fitness training, such as gyms, fitness and recreational fac uh, facilities, with exception for youth recreational sports. This requirement will also apply to sporting events, casinos, bingo halls, gaming establishments, concerts, music festivals, um, theaters, cinemas, and racing venues. Uh, the one thing that I want to point out, but even with this proof of vaccination requirement coming into effect, there is still a requirement that we continue to follow all of those other public health measures that are requirements in the Reopening Ontario Act. Things like masking requirements, capacity limits, screening, physical distancing, contact tracing are all still required as part of the Reopening Ontario Act. So tonight is a good opportunity for us to review those requirements and see how they apply to your particular setting. If you want to get more information on the proof of vaccination information, we have a web page set up for that. If you navigate to hamilton.ca coronavirus, you'll be able to access some more information on the proof of vaccination policies that have been rolled out in the province. So in summary, I just want to highlight, um, and I've copied this table from the Ministry's Guidance for Businesses, and I just want to present just at a high level um, where proof of vaccination is required and where no proof of vaccination is required. So in this table, it's broken down by setting, activity type, and whether proof of vaccination is required or not. So just a couple of points to summarize on this slide. Uh, youths under the age of 18 actively participating in indoor organized sport, including things like training, practices, games and competitions, do not have to provide proof of vaccination. So for example, this would include a sports league, organized pickup sports, dance classes, martial arts, swimming classes, etc. For workers or volunteers, including coaches and officials at private sports facilities, no proof of vaccination is required. However, some sports organizations and associations may have more stringent rules with respect to proof of vaccination that participants and others will need to follow. When we look at settings where proof of vaccination is required, um, adult patrons age 18 plus accessing the facility for any purpose, including parents or guardians of youth participating in an organized sport, are required to provide proof of identification and of being fully vaccinated COVID-19 at the point of entry. The same requirements also apply to youth spectators age 12 and above, youths who are using a gym or other area with exercise equipment or weights, um, must show proof of vaccination unless they're actively participating in an organized sport. And then lastly, our rec colleagues will speak more to this point, but all patrons, including but not limited to permit holders, coaches, officials, sport team staff members, or volunteers using City of Hamilton facilities will have to show proof of vaccination. Okay. So if we talk about COVID-19, let's move to talking about COVID-19 safety plans and some of the requirements from the ROA um, as well. So as you know, um, the Reopening Ontario Act requires that a person responsible for a business that is open must prepare and make available a COVID-19 safety plan. In your safety plan, you want to discuss things that you're actively putting in place, things that your business, place, facility, or establishments are putting in place or will be implementing to reduce the spread of COVID-19. You want to talk about things that cover how you'll be implementing screening for your patrons coming in, screening for staff, physical distancing throughout the space, the requirements for wearing non-medical masks by patrons, and then also covering off any exemptions and how that will be handled in the facility, cleaning and disinfection of high touch surfaces throughout the space, and the use of personal protective equipment by staff. 
a couple of other points about COVID-19 safety plans. They have to be in writing and also have to be posted. Uh, and they should be made available to any person to review upon their request. And when you're posting it, you wanna post it in a spot or in a location where it'll come to the attention of those working in or attending the location. For facilities used for indoor or outdoor sports and recreational fitness activities, the co your COVID safety plan should also include information that will talk about how you're preventing gatherings or crowding um, at your event or at your place um, where the recreational activity is happening. Ensure that you're discussing how physical distancing um, requirements in the ROA, so that's section 3.2, will be complied with in the business or place or at the event, and you're mitigating any risk of interactive activities, exhibits, or games that may be included in a part of that business, taking part in that business or place or at the event. One of the other items that are required in the ROA is uh, capacity limits. So as the person responsible for a place or a business or a facility, you should limit the number of persons in the place of the business so that everybody is able to practice a physical distancing of at least two meters from other persons and the household members with exceptions for household members living together. And the total number of members total number of members of the public in the business or facility at any one time does not exceed the allowable capacity limit. The ROA also outlines some rules around going about determining capacity limits. I've summarized these on the slides for you, but they're based on your occupant load from the fire code um, to guide what your capacity limits would be in an indoor setting. And just a reminder that players do not count towards your gathering limits. So players and coaches do not count towards your gathering limits. Okay. So let's talk about some of the infection prevention um, and control pieces that are outlined in the ROA, but I'm just pulling them out just for awareness of these particular items. So Ontario Regulation 364.20, which is the regulation that summarizes the rules for current step three mandates to wearing a face mask that covers the mouth, nose and chin in an indoor public place and workplaces. So a couple of points here to, to make clear is that when we talk about um, face coverings and face masks, they must be worn in the common areas, including change rooms, unless exemptions outlined in the ROA applies. Um, the mask or face covering can be removed when actively playing the sport. Staff working in the event may have to wear a higher grade level of mask, so they may have to wear a medical grade mask in certain situations. So this is where they may need to wear appropriate personal protective equipment um, when they're interacting with patrons who are not wearing a mask, so they're mask exempt, and that staff member would have to come within two meters of that patron, and there is no barrier in place. So there's no plexiglass or other impermeable barriers separating that staff member from that patron using that space. On this slide, I've also summarized um, and perhaps would be helpful is some information on face coverings and face masks to ensure that you do provide proper training to your staff on how to put on a mask properly, how to remove it and safe disposal of those masks and PPE. So when we talk about just, I wanna clarify as well, the use of eye protection. When we talk about eye protection, I'm referring to the use of face shields goggles and or safety glasses, that would be appropriate eye protection that you would need to wear in the circumstances I described above where um, the staff is likely to come in contact within two meters of a patron that's not wearing a mask and the staff person is not separated by a plexiglass barrier or another impermeable membrane or barrier, sorry. The ROA also talks about signage and screening requirements. So a reminder that every patron or customer coming into the facility must be screened for COVID-19 symptoms and risk factors. And then every staff member entering into the workplace must be actively screened for COVID-19 symptoms and risk factors. 
And as a person responsible for the facility, you must complete contact tracing where you're recording the name and contact information for every person who enters the facility. On this slide, I've also included some links to the provincial resources for um, the customer uh, screening tool and then the employer screening tool as well. So I, a note here for parents and guardians. So if you're working with parents and guardians, you wanna ensure that they're screening themselves and their children prior to leaving home. And then if there's a failed screening that they're staying home, even if there's one symptom present. So a failed screen on the tool is a failed screen where those family members should stay at home and follow the directions on the screening tool to get a COVID-19 test completed at a local assessment center. And just a reminder that face covering and mask must be worn at all times in the indoor facility unless there's an exemption under the ROA that applies and a physical distancing of at least two meters from people that you don't live with would also apply as well. So signage supporting those recommendations should also be posted at the facility. So when people are coming into your facility at that entrance, you wanna clearly communicate the procedures that you have in place for physical distancing between staff and patrons. You wanna post some signage to remind them around the need for them to wash their hands using alcohol-based hand sanitizer, good respiratory etiquette around sneezing and coughing, reminders around wearing of mask, and a passive screening tool that shows the COVID-19 symptoms that someone attending the location can screen themselves with. You also wanna make sure that your employees are aware of the common COVID-19 symptoms. In addition to active screening upon arrival, you wanna instruct them to complete the daily prevention screening tool for workplaces before, return, before reporting to work. So let's talk about physical distancing requirements from the ROA. So a couple of points here to summarize on the slides is that spectators must maintain physical distancing of at least two meters from people they don't live with. And when you're looking at how you're encouraging physical distancing in a space, you should think about um, the need of reducing capacity in each room, the venue or that space to allow for that physical distancing of two meters um, in those spaces. In <clears throat> To allow for cleaning and disinfection efforts, you want a schedule um, that allows for adequate time to thoroughly clean and disinfect equipment and spaces. So things, places like washrooms, change rooms, um, gyms where there's fitness equipments between each group and booking. Okay. I want to cover some points around environmental cleaning and disinfection as well. And just a reminder that you know, one of the things that have worked really well is that if you create a cleaning procedure that's specific to your location and you utilize cleaning checklists um, to guide your staff in your environmental cleaning for your policies, these policies should be site specific with considerations for the need and the use of your setting. So when you're looking at creating your policies, you wanna cover things around indoor surfaces and consider indoor surfaces that are frequently touched. Um, so those would be called high touch surfaces and they should be cleaned and disinfected at least once per day and when visibly dirty. Commonly touched surfaces such as doors, doors hand, door handles, light switches, um, seating that includes armrests and barriers between staff and visitors should be added to your cleaning checklist and ensure that they're being cleaned regularly to maintain sanitary conditions and also clean and disinfect bathrooms, washrooms as frequently as is necessary to maintain sanitary conditions. As a reference um, for this group, I've included a Public Health Ontario resource that talks about cleaning and disinfecting in public spaces that you can follow to get some more information on the recommendations for environmental cleaning. Just also on this topic, just a reminder for folks that the common cleaners that you're able to access and use are sufficient at killing COVID-19. When you're selecting a disinfectant, you wanna choose something that has um, an eight digit code on it, call it drug identification number. This is a DIN number. And what this would tell you is that this is a product that is approved by Health Canada um, with perhaps evidence against COVID-19. 
Health Canada has an online registry that you'd be able to go online and search to see if a product that you're currently using as part of your environmental cleaning policies has been approved or has been shown to be effective against COVID-19. When you're using these cleaners and disinfectants, just a reminder to follow your manufacturer's instructions for use, um, especially when you're mixing cleaners and or disinfectants, because that's not a typically that's not typically encouraged, because uh, you may have a workplace hazard present by mixing chemicals and cleaners. The other point that I want to <clears throat> highlight is to also provide training for employees on how to protect themselves and visitors, um, especially when they're handling some of these cleaners and disinfectants and ensuring that they're following the manufacturer's instructions for use, especially on an important item called the contact time. This is the amount of time that that disinfectant has to be in contact with that surface to kill any COVID-19 um, virus that might be on that surface. So the key message here for you is to ensure that you're following the manufacturer's instruction for use for that particular product. Okay. So that was a, a quick overview of the Reopening Ontario Act and the recommendations that apply around infection prevention and control. I wanna pass it over to Erin Fuller, who will talk about um, COVID-19 case management with sport organizations. Thank you, Lachman, and good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to speak a little bit about um, how we manage a, a positive COVID case in public health, and then in the context of uh, sports and teams, what that looks like when we're following up with contacts. So uh, just briefly, um, we do follow up by phone with everyone who tests positive for COVID. And during that initial uh, phone conversation, we are going to talk about things like symptoms, uh, where they may have gotten uh, COVID from, uh, vaccination status, um, amongst other things. Um, we're going to provide some information about isolation and uh, how long somebody should be isolating for. Um, and then look at anyone that they may have come in contact with uh, while they were contagious. Um, we do that by looking at a number of different factors and it is an individualized assessment um, for each particular person. So we're gonna look at uh, physical distancing, use of masks, uh, the length of time that somebody was uh, interacting with that uh, individual, uh, the type of activity that they were doing. So in the context of sport, that might look like um, uh, asking about who they may have come on and off the field or the ice or whatever the setting might be. Did they take any breaks with, um, with others? Um, and what was the activity that they were doing? Um, was it a high contact sport or uh, were they doing drills where they were all physically distant? So each situation is a little bit different um, and we do look at each one individually. And when we're identifying that there are some close contacts, we are going to collect that information from, from that individual. And in, uh, in the case of a team, then we would be co collecting information about uh, the coach or for the coach um, or the, the lead of the organization so that we can be in touch with, um, with that individual to identify um, the other team members um, and, uh, and anybody else that's, that's relevant, um, coaches or, or that kind of thing. Um, so when we're following up with contacts um, on a team, uh, we will notify all close contacts um, that can take different forms. Um, sometimes that's a text message. Um, sometimes and most often it's a phone call. In some cases, particularly with schools or daycares, it might be a letter. Uh, the recommendation is that anyone who is identified as a close contact um, that they seek testing at an assessment center immediately upon notification and around day seven of their uh, following that exposure. And if they develop any symptoms um, during that period of time. Uh, so uh, the guidelines for everyone right now are that we are all monitoring for symptoms. Um, and if 
if someone is symptomatic that they um, are quarantining and uh, getting tested. Uh, for those that have been identified as a close contact, um, those that are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated are required to uh, quarantine. Uh, generally, those who are fully vaccinated or have tested positive uh, within the past 90 days can be excluded from quarantine. Um, there are some exceptions to that, but that's uh, kind of the general guideline. Um, and anyone who is symptomatic as well would also need to quarantine and get tested. So depending on the situation, uh, the recommendations may differ a little bit, um, particularly for high risk situations, but hopefully that gives you a sense of um, what it looks like within public health uh, when somebody does test positive and how we follow up with those close contacts. Thanks, Erin. And just before we hand it back to Helen, just a summary of um, how to get in touch. If you need some additional information, you can visit our webpage um, or call our COVID-19 hotline or email us uh, with any questions you may have. That's it. That's, that's it, Helen. Wow. Thank you. You know what? I thought I knew it all, but I learned so much during your presentation, Latchman and Aaron. Thank you so, so much. That was fantastic. Uh, is Dr. Tran on here at all? Did, did he? He yep. might jump in. Yes? Yes, I am. Hi. I joined I I about 10, 15 minutes ago. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, doctor. Is there anything you'd like to add to the presentation? No, I think, I mean, what I saw from Latchman and Aaron uh, seemed to cover it well. Okay. If, uh, when, if and when we have some questions later on, you might want to jump in on that. But thank you for tuning in. That's excellent. So thank you to Latchman and Aaron. We're going to move on to our, our second uh, set of panelists, Steve Sabor and Laura Kerr from the City of Hamilton. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Helen. I appreciate uh, uh, the invite uh, from um, Sport Hamilton, and uh, just want to uh, introduce uh, again Laura Kerr, uh, my colleague from uh, Recreation Manager Program Services, as well, who will be joining me in uh, in this part of our presentation. I'd be remiss to uh, to not uh, to 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 really shout out to all the coaches that are out there today. As you know, it's National Coaches Week and uh, we know that the coaches play a very pivotal role within the sport uh, uh, environment. So we just wanna congratulate and thank all the coaches and, and uh, for their hard work and dedication, especially uh, within these last 19 months. Uh, we normally have our, our annual sport volunteer dinner uh, and appreciation banquet. And uh, it, we, we hope to, to bring it back next year and, and be able to celebrate the coaches and all the great work that uh, all the sport organizations do across our city. Uh, I just wanted to, um, you know, follow up on our colleagues from public health and uh, the great work uh, and, and the great information that they were able to provide. I think our, our presentation will really speak to the context within our uh, recreation centers uh, as, as providers of facilities. Um, you know, we have a duty and obligation to, uh, to provide that opportunity for our sport organizations. And uh, we've, we've really pivoted as, as you have throughout these uh, last 19 months to try to uh, adapt to all these different phases and steps and, and uh, uh, options that we've had to actually work around in the last uh, little bit. Um, if we want to just go on to the next slide, I just wanted to, uh, before doing that, uh, just uh, we'll, we'll get the right slide up there in a second, but I will just talk about understanding the landscape of our um, of, of our situation right now. So many of the sport organizations throughout the city uh, will have um, a lot of different actors that are involved within uh, their programming. And I just wanted to point out and maybe just clarify a little bit at this stage, 
uh, how you as either coach uh, an organization, um, a leader and administrator within the sport uh, community uh, fits into this because we've had a lot of questions and a lot of confusion on, on that piece. So from the, from the first uh, top level, the provincial government who has uh, introduced the Reopening Ontario Act and as, as you heard Latchman and Aaron talk about the ROA, uh, these are actually the laws, the regulations that really uh, are, are what we all are responsible in terms of uh, following. It's the law. Um, typically, we have those press conferences and uh, information sessions, but it's the actual regulations that really give us the opportunity to enact and implement these, uh, these different procedures. You will have uh, input and uh, work along with your sport governing body. So this might be your national sport, or, uh, sport organization or your provincial sport organization most, most likely at this point. And we know that we have Paul uh, here later on to talk about uh, Athletics Ontario and, and how they have uh, managed through this. But uh, the sport governing bodies are a very important construct and uh, piece of the sport community. Uh, they're your leaders, uh, they provide the guidance, uh, they're the experts in, in that area. Uh, and, and you will have to, as, as a local sport organization, uh, whether it's the organization, the parents, uh, the coaches, administrators, uh, really lean on their, their guidance and leadership in that regard. Um, they have worked alongside uh, the Ministry of, of uh, Tourism, Sport, uh, Heritage and Cultural Industries to provide return to work, uh, return to play guidelines for every single sport. So uh, very important to keep aware and be up to date on, on the changes that, uh, that they have provided. Uh, obviously from hearing from our, our our colleagues in public health, uh, the local public health units, uh, and especially our medical officer health uh, is the lead in terms of keeping our community safe and, and providing that input in terms of what is uh, particular and necessary for our particular uh, local health unit. Uh, as you navigate through uh, some of these uh, changes and some of these regulations and, and how you program within your own organization, you will come to realize that, especially if you are um, participating in other uh, areas of the province um, when it comes down to games and tournaments and things of that nature, that many uh, different public health units have um, have the ability to uh, put stricter uh, restrictions on, on uh, their parameters, as Latchman has mentioned earlier. So it's very important to be aware of this, especially if you are a traveling uh, team or traveling sport in which you're uh, working through a number of different uh, jurisdictions. Uh, finally, our Emergency Operations Center, it's really our senior leadership committee and group that uh, has been uh, given the, the power through bylaw uh, to provide that implementation and leadership through this pandemic. Uh, they provide us our direction uh, along with uh, input uh, and direction from public health uh, to, to figure out what exactly is appropriate for our particular jurisdiction in the city of Hamilton. What Laura and I will talk about in the next few slides really uh, will focus on city of Hamilton facilities as uh, again, we are uh, a strong and uh, big supporter of sport and recreation with the city and, and have uh, a big majority of the facilities that uh, most sport organizations use. I won't go too far into um, these next few slides. Uh, they, they do uh, really focus on the the specific pieces from a city of Hamilton uh, recreation facilities perspective. Uh, I know Latchman talked a little bit about this, but um, we have, uh, and you'll have an opportunity to have a copy of this that we'll provide uh, to Helen and Sport Hamilton uh, that you can take along with you. Um, but I just wanted to take a few minutes to highlight a few of these things that we have here uh, that you see in front of us. So obviously the COVID-19 vaccine requirement as we've we've talked about and, and uh, comes into effect uh, today uh, and how we're dealing with it within our recreation centers and, and Laura will talk a little bit about that in a little in a few slides but um, really important to note that 
uh, we all we all are working with this uh, uh, together. Uh, we're looking for opportunities to make sure that we are uh, complying with the regulations. Um, we've undergone a lot of uh, training uh, at this point in terms of staffing, uh, as Latchman talked about signage and, um, and and processes that we have developed along with uh, our colleagues throughout the corporation to make sure that our facilities are ready to receive uh, and provide those opportunities, but also make sure that we are um, following those regulations as well. Uh, you can see that uh, you know, we do have a number of different things from a general perspective uh, that uh, we require from our sport organizations as facility renters. Um, you know, COVID-19 safety plan, as Lashman talked about from a business perspective, um, but from, from a sport organization perspective, and, and I'm sure that um, many of your, your provincial sport organizations have done a lot of work in, in leadership and in terms of developing templates for local sport organizations to uh, develop their COVID-19 safety plan, which really speaks to all the, all the different things, the requirements, regulations that are needed uh, to ensure um, that we're, we're properly screening, properly uh, managing distancing and and crowd control as well. So that is something that we have definitely worked with our uh, local sport groups to uh, make sure that they do have. Uh, I can tell you that if we, from a recreational perspective, have any issues with uh, any any uh, situations at any of our centers, we'll definitely have those conversations with those uh, organizers and, and local sport groups to make sure that uh, we are again reviewing the COVID-19 safety plan, their safety plan, and, and really figuring out how uh, we, we manage through some of those pieces there. Um, health screening and contact screening is definitely something that uh, we have put on our local sport groups as uh, their requirements. Uh, this is something that um, they have more of a um, ability to understand their participants. Uh, they are responsible for contact tracing and, and screening of their participants, uh, whether it's athletes and coaches that are coming in during their rental period, as well as the spectators as well. So it's very important for uh, our sport groups to be responsible in that aspect and, and working along our uh, City of Hamilton staff to make sure that uh, the members do have that information and, and, uh, and feel comfortable coming into our facilities in that regard. Uh, as you see here uh, on the screen, uh, we do have um, specific outdoor uh, requirements, and, and I understand our focus is on indoor this today, but there are a number of different organizations that have started out uh, their, um, their plans and their implementation and back to programming on the outdoor scene and, and are coming back inside. Uh, as you know, that we are currently in step three of uh, of the Reopening Ontario Act and the progression in, in that sense. So there are a number of things, as you can see, that uh, our outdoor user groups have, have to, uh, to maintain. And again, uh, we've tried to package this in an area in which it's, it's legible, it's, it's quick, uh, for our, our sport organizations and uh, sport enthusiasts to understand. Um, you know, when we talk about spectators, again, as our public health colleagues mentioned, maintaining uh, that, uh, that, that physical distancing is required in, in all our centers. Uh, we do have capacity limits that we have taken a look at in all of our centers. If we look at arenas, for example, uh, each, each arena has a specific uh, capacity limit that uh, really maintains this uh, this physical distancing need. And again, we rely upon our sport organizations to uh, share in that uh, responsibility and, and making sure that our spectators are, are, are uh, abiding. Very important for uh, visiting teams as well, um, working with them and in, in, in making sure that they have that information uh, when they do come and, and, and play against your teams. Um, that, that information needs to be shared and we've worked with our sport groups in, in doing that. 
I'll just move over to the, the next slide before I jump over to Laura uh, in terms of the indoor uh, requirements. And, and I just want to point out uh, again uh, from, a, from a sports safety plan aspect, um, again, it is required. We have the same uh, kind of capacity limits or needs for an indoor perspective uh, based on the facility and square footage uh, up to 50% capacity. And, and as Latchman uh, talked about, um, based on a number of different parameters, whether it's fire code, building code, uh, we are, again are working within our all of our facilities to maintain and uh, to, to ensure that these elements are, are really put in place for uh, our participants. Uh, a number of things that you see on the screen really uh, deal with our, our recreational programs, but again, uh, we do know that our sport groups are using our facilities for meetings, uh, conferences, events, whether it's a coaching course um, or a training session for your, your leadership, your administration. Again, these are things that we have to make sure that we, we have in place and, and rely upon our uh, our sport organizations to to be compliant with. So, from from our perspective, we we feel this as a partnership. Um, we feel this as a as a role that we all have to take in terms of making sure that we are developing these uh, requirements and and really speaking to our, um, our our regulations that have been passed along from the provincial government. So, uh, if there are any questions, again, we would love to have uh, any opportunity to answer any of these questions at the end. But I think uh, I'd like to pass it along to Laura just to talk a little bit about uh, the vaccine verification process within our recreation centers and how that impacts our sport groups in a, in a way that you can understand. Great, thank you, Steve, that's helpful. And good evening, everybody. As uh, Steve mentioned, my name is Laura Kerr, and I'm the manager of program development within recreation, um, where Steve has been focused on the sport groups and supporting uh, the return to sport. Uh, I've been specifically supporting the recreation facilities returning to being open and operational. What's on the, you know, everybody's brain right now is the vaccine verification that came into effect today. I know Latchman covered some great information in regards to the vaccine verification, why it's required, where you're going to see it required. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how that will play out at recreation facilities, especially for groups that are looking to use uh, the variety of our facilities. So vaccine verification does apply to anybody who is entering an indoor facility for sports, uh, fitness meetings or events. So that does apply to all of our recreation centers, arenas, community buildings uh, that we have across the city of Hamilton. It is indoor facility, so it does not apply to outdoor environments such as fields or other outdoor assets. At time of entry, uh, you will be required to show your proof of vaccination. Uh, that could either take place at the front door with a staff at a facility or at the reception that's uh, you know, adjacent to the door. At our centers to assist with the screening, we will be focused on one main entrance. So I know we've, to assist with crowd controls, had uh, previously allowed multiple entrances, but we will be focused on one main entrance so we can do the vaccine verification. A general rule of thumb, an easy way to think about it is everybody must show their vaccine unless they're in the bulleted list of exemptions. Uh, so it's an easy way to think about it. You're coming into a recreation facility, be prepared for your vaccine verification. For our staff and to assist our screeners on the door, uh, we have developed this card on the left. It's a good visual and that will assist them in understanding when they're required to show vac or, sorry, verify vaccination upon entry. We will not be verifying vaccines for someone who's just doing a customer transaction, paying for a permit, uh, registering for a program, but does not intend to stay after that purchase. Uh, people just need to use the washroom, not in the change rooms, uh, be permitted to do so. Children 11 and under are, uh, will not be required to show vaccine verification. Organized sport participants, uh, so that's ex extended up to the age of 17, will not be required to show vaccine verification. They must be actively engaged in play. So if they are going to stay to watch another game or uh, come to the facility before or afterwards, they're considered a spectator uh, between the ages of 12 and 17 and will need to show. A City of Hamilton staff or contractors uh, will follow the staff vaccination policy that the City of Hamilton uh, has. 
Individuals that will be required to uh, have their vaccine status verified is non-sport participants 12 and up. That includes you know, art, music, open gym, fitness programs, certification, training programs. Um, majority of people on this webinar are uh, sport user groups. Uh, so your sport participants, athletes, coaches, and officials 18 and up uh, will be required to show their vaccine uh, verification. Parent or spectators 12 plus will be required to show. The exemptions and a short list of the exemptions, if you go to hamilton.ca slash recreation, uh, is on the front page, uh, which includes this bulleted list here. Again, those under the age of 12, organized sport participants 17 and under, individuals with a medical exemption, this does require medical documentation upon entry that will be reviewed. Uh, again, individuals using the washroom or going to an outdoor space, and individuals accessing social services on site. We have been receiving a number of uh, questions. So the regulations for the vaccine verification came out uh, a week and a day ago. Uh, so we've been working through those regulations and turning that into some policy on site of what you'll see at our facilities. We have had a number of questions um, from a lot of user groups. We pulled out some of the key frequently asked questions in regards to the vaccines, uh, specifically for sport users. Some of those questions we're hearing, and I'll give a brief uh, answer to some of them so that you have it here today, but all of the questions, uh, more than what's here, is again listed at hamilton.ca slash recreation, and we'll continue to add to that frequently asked questions list uh, as we progress over the next couple of weeks. Keep in mind this page is related specifically to recreation and recreation facilities. If you're looking for public health information um, or vaccine requirements, go to hamilton.ca slash coronavirus or slash proof of vaccination. So will my vaccination records or personal health information be kept or recorded? Uh, no business can retain or organization can retain vaccination status or records. Uh, we will not be retaining them at our facilities. We will be requiring it each time you come to the facility and to show uh, that proof of vaccination. Organizations are not permitted to keep those vaccine records and vouch for a team or for players coming in. They will need to show that at time of entry. Are you required to show ID and what is acceptable ID? So for this first phase, uh, before the QR code is launched from the province, you will be required to show your proof of vaccination, uh, that you're fully vaccinated plus 14 days, uh, your vaccine receipt, as well as ID. The ID must only show your name and your birthday, which matches the vaccination record. So it does not require to be photo ID. It can be expired um, and you can show us uh, copies or a visual copy on your phone as well. So we are encouraging, especially youth uh, who, you know, parents don't exactly let them walk around with their passport or birth certificate to load that into their phone and have it prepared uh, to be visually shown at time of entry. What programs are included in the 12 to 17 year old sport exemption? So the exemption applies to organized sport. The guidance documents does provide some um, examples uh, such as training, games, competitions, uh, swimming lessons, sports leagues. We will be classifying in our recreation centers registered sport programs um, and our sport users as within that exemption. Uh, this will not apply to open gyms or non-instructed uh, or organized programs, but for, again, the people on this call, it will apply to any permit holders, again, as long as it's for a, a sport purpose and they're actively playing in that sport. Are paid coaches and staff required to show vaccine verification? If they're 18 and over, yes. Uh, there are is some um, misinformation or, or confusion around exemption for workers and coaches on site um, and how that's applied. In the City of Hamilton facilities, uh, this worker exemption applies to City of Hamilton staff and contractors. Any permit holders for anyone you're inviting to the site are, are considered members of the public and will be required to show their vaccine verification, including your coaches, volunteers, and officials. And what if I refuse to show vaccine verification? So the requirement to show uh, your verification at time of entry is uh, under the Provincial Act. If you refuse to show, we would refuse entry. Um, if an individual chooses to still continue to enter the facility, uh, we would be following up and treating that as trespassing and following up with our authorities. In recreation, we do have a zero tolerance policy for staff harassment, incitement of violence, 
actual violence or physical um, assault. And we will be um, issuing immediate suspensions for six months for anybody who chooses to harm or threaten staff. We are looking to maintain the environments as positive, safe environments for the children and the sport users and their families. Uh, and, and won't be putting up with people at the door who are uh, not following uh, staff direction or the requirements under the ROA. So those are some common questions. Again, go to hamilton.ca uh, to continue to see uh, answers to more questions on there. In recreation, we do have all of our recreation facilities uh, opened. So recovery, um, has been slower, but as of this fall, we do have about 20 pools open, uh, 15 plus arenas, uh, 15 plus gyms are open uh, for the community and operated by the recreation division. We do know there'll be increased pressure on our facilities going into the fall, especially as the school boards continue to restrict their rentals or access to their school facilities. In arenas, there's various times and openings uh, and permits are being accepted right now. For gyms and pools, permits are available. Right now, we're trying to get our previous renters, partners, and sport organizations back uh, for the fall, and we'll be focused on the winter for uh, new groups or new um, rental requests. Meeting rooms are available, again, with restrictions, vaccine verifications required with reduced capacity limits. If you uh, are looking to rent a facility or a new user or a previous unit user, you can send your rental requests for availability or facilities that might be available within the community to recreation.rentals at hamilton.ca. Uh, these next couple of slides just outline um, the key responsibilities as we move forward. I really want to emphasize what Steve said, that this is a partnership. This is a coordinated effort. We rely on each other. We will have facilities that are safe, clean, operated, and following all regulations under the ROA, but we do rely on our permit holders and our sport user groups uh, to communicate those expectations to their players and family um, and meet those expectations that Steve outlined in the user guidelines document. Organizations will continue to be responsible for participant screening. That includes uh, health screening and contact tracing. And that includes spectators. So that's anyone that's invited to the site as part of your permit. Uh, the group will be responsible for uh, screening and contact tracing. Organizations are also responsible then for keeping those records. You heard public health talk about in the event that there's a positive case. And so if they do require follow-up or communication to other individuals that may have been there on the same day and time, uh, they will reach out to you to uh, retrieve those lists and work with you to get that communication to the individuals that were there. You must keep these uh, the contact tracing records for 30 days. All other records, including vaccination records, should not be kept. Again, lean on your governing body for support. There's a lot of apps, there's creative ways and QR codes that uh, organizations have been able to reduce some of the burden in checking in users as they come on site. City of Hamilton staff will be on site. We will continue to operate the buildings, help direct traffic, identify main entrances and lineup areas to reduce gathering. And as of today, verifying that vaccine status. So we will not be uh, putting the requirement on verifying vaccines on user groups. City of Hamilton staff uh, will be responsible for that. We will also address and follow up with issues on mass bylaw or any uh, concerns with capacity or the ability to distance. Each facility will have a staff representative that can assist with answering questions or concerns, clarifying that user guidelines document, as well as we'll continue to maintain the facility, ensure cleaning records are kept and that it's in a clean and sanitary condition. We will also be following up on any incidences of um, violence, aggression, harassment, uh, and following through with issuing those zero tolerance uh, bans under our policy. Some additional items just to note is food concessions do remain closed. We are looking to get our sport users back up uh, and before we uh, move on to food services in that business unit. Individuals are permitted to eat and drink within our recreation facilities now, but must be seated to consume and remove their mask. Access to storage space is limited. If you require storage or set up requirements or specific equipment, as always, you can put that in your rental request or speak to your facility supervisor. And I'll uh, turn over to Steve to close it out. Thank you, Laura. Lots of great information. And 
uh, I think one of the things that we wanted to, to uh, leave you with uh, in this regard is, you know, we talk a lot about the uh, regulations and uh, restrictions and things that you need to do from um, a preparation perspective, but I think it's really important to also recognize the human aspect of things, the, the sport uh, development aspects that uh, we, uh, we still need to keep in mind. So uh, one of those things is recognizing those stressors, knowing that we all have different ways of dealing with stress. Uh, different ways uh, of coping and uh, getting through a situation. We know that everyone, whether it's an athlete, a coach, family, uh, they all have dealt with this in, in their own specific and unique ways. And I think it's really uh, important to hone in on recognizing that that's an important piece as we return back to sport, as you work with your, your teams, your coaches, your, your families, um, you know, the family should and, and the parents really should be uh, supporting their their athletes, their 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 kids um, in, in a way that is positive. Um, giving those supports to your coaches and your administrators uh, as well is very important. And, and knowing that uh, they might have uh, different ways of how they were coping through this and, and still maybe coping uh, through all the different changes and, and trying to support them. So really important in that regard. Uh, from a sports skill perspective uh, and actual implementation, again, we're, a con we're all concerned about uh, having uh, a gradual return to play and gradual return to sport. Um, as a coach myself, ensuring that you know my athletes are are being trained in a way that uh, I don't expect um, you know injuries to happen. I'm not pushing them as as much as they cannot go forward to. Um, just knowing them as athletes, knowing them as uh, individuals, and, and making sure that we're taking care of uh, them from a physical standpoint too, training in a proper way the progressions that you all um, are, are very aware of. Uh, also realizing that that athletics, that skill uh, piece may have dropped. Uh, I know even from coaches perspective, trying to motivate your athletes, it has been hard, it has been challenging. And then when you get back out to return to play, it's not uh, typically uh, always the same as, uh, as we had prior to the pandemic starting. So being cognizant of that piece is really important. Uh, we also found through best practice that uh, the communication piece is very, very important to your membership, uh, really important to over communicate at some times, especially in this time type of environment, uh, to make sure people are kept up to speed with with how your organization is progressing, how they're preparing, um, you know, knowing that they have you as support and, and providing those uh, pieces of information that uh, allow them to mitigate some of their stresses is very important. So over communication is, is never a bad thing. And as, as different aspects of, of your organization, again, if you're a coach, an athlete, administrator, you search out those uh, those opportunities to gain better resources. You know, I think this this time period has allowed us to all think of uh, of different ways of how to deliver things and and really sharing tips and and strategies and having forums such as this to really talk about uh, how we can provide. Um, you know, increased opportunities for sport development and, and getting athletes and coaches and teams back into that, uh, that realm. So very important to, to remember about the, that human aspect, that sport development aspect that uh, we really want to uh, consider in, in this environment. You said a lot of things from from our perspective. Again, we have focused on really City of Hamilton facilities. Uh, many of the regulations really also apply uh, to private organizations. We do recognize that our that we as a city have uh, specific things that are, uh, are 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 really honed in for our facilities. But again, if you'd like any further information, we have some links that uh, will be shared with you. Uh, Hamilton.ca slash recreation provides a number of the FA cues that Laura was talking about, uh, our requirements uh, that, that are there in terms of proof of vaccination. You also have public health, um, as uh, our colleagues have mentioned uh, in our previous presentation, uh, are there. If you have any specific questions related to sport, uh, I have provided my contact information is, uh, on, this, on the screen as well. And uh, once again, we appreciate all the work that our sport groups uh, have done. Uh, has been challenging, but very re rewarding to get back into to, um, you know, play and, and doing things that we all love. So hopefully we as a city and a recreation division will continue to help you uh, as you progress uh, through this return to play.
Okay, we, uh, thank you, Steve and Laura. That was an amazing presentation. If we do have some questions, um, certainly we'll try to address those at the end of the present uh, of the next presentation as well. If you don't mind, if that's okay, just for a, a matter of um, time that we're looking at. So uh, thanks very much. That was an amazing uh, presentation. And also, Steve, thanks so much for uh, recognizing the National uh, Coaches Week and recognizing our volunteer coaches. I know you do run the sport volunteer dinner during this time. So uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that it's not um, being able to be run this, this year, but certainly uh, let's hope and keep our fingers crossed for the next time, so certainly. And again, thank you to all those coaches and volunteers out there with all of the sports groups. Thank you. And finally, we have Mr. Paul Osland from um, uh, Athletics Ontario. Take it away, Paul. Great, thanks, thanks, Helen. And good evening, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to present tonight. Before I get started, I just have to um, start by mentioning that I have a strong connection with Hamilton as I was living in Hamilton when I was training for and competed at the 1988 Olympics and was fortunate enough to be honored by the city of as one of several Hamilton Olympians. So I have a very near and dear to my heart um, uh, relationship with Hamilton. Um, just getting back to the presentation now, pre-COVID life really seems like a bit of a distant memory and I can still recall when the call was made to basically shut everything down on March 15th. We were lucky enough in the athletics world that most of our indoor season had just recently finished. Um, we had one last event indoors, which was the Canadian Masters Championships, and that was going to be held in St. John, New Brunswick. At the time, I was a volunteer president and chair of the Canadian Masters Athletics Association. And on the Thursday before the Monday lockdown, um, that had already been announced, we had to make the decision to go ahead with the event or postpone or cancel it. To make matters worse, uh, there were already significant number of people who had already flown out to the meet. In the end, we made the decision in the interest of safety to our members to cancel the event. Little did we know that it would be a long time before things really started to open up and get back to normal. Clearly, we are still nowhere close to normal and we're actually beginning conversations about what it's likely to be like in this new normal. Uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna try and cover our journey from this initial lockdown through the return to sport programs and protocols that had to be developed in order for us to have any training and competitions for our members. I'll touch upon how we worked with our community to do this through the collective support and patience of our members. I'll then touch on some of the specific indoor, outdoor and cross country seasons that we had and I'll try and cover some of the differences between 2020 and 2021. So after the major lockdown between March 17th and the end of May, and we started to see a glimmer of hope that the summer of 2020 would not be completely lost. While the elementary and secondary schools had already lost their major outdoor sports seasons, we were yet hopeful that we could do something for the kids at the club level over the summer. But first, we had to develop a set of return to sport guidelines. And um, Steve and Laura have already talked a little bit about um, uh, the, some of those processes and the fact that each sport was really responsible for identifying and developing those. Um, we, we set up uh, a number of um, um, weekly town hall meetings. And we started in March. 25th of 2020. Um, that reverted to bi-weekly meetings only this past July. And so in total, we had between March 25th and now over 60 town hall meetings um, that uh, we went through and had conversations with all of our uh, members about what was going on and um, where we were going with, um, with trying to get them back on track. The, the biggest benefit of this without even talking for a second about the, the guidelines that was created was the, the, the communications and uh, support that we developed with our, um, with our clubs and our coaches and our members. And it was really through that that we were able to get through this collectively as a community. And I have to say that I've been in the sport for well over 40 years, going on 50 years. 
And I've never seen such um, a strength in community that um, really rallied around this um, major challenge that we had. And we, in Ontario, provided the leadership to co-chair a committee with our national body, Athletics Canada, and we included representatives from several other provinces to develop a national back on track guidelines. These are still in use today. Some of the basic information, like the um, gathering sizes, physical distancing, mask wearing, screening, contract tracing, um, of course, we're part of that, but we also included more sport specific requirements like eliminating mass starts, waterfall starts, um, alternating lanes on the track for our sprint events, um, sanitizing starting blocks, uh, putting tarps on high jump and pole vault mats and other, other unique situations that would only be specific to, um, to the athletics world. And this really allowed us to start training and, um, and initiate some modified competitions. Formal practices really started near the middle to end of June. And um, we were then able to begin modified track meets starting in the middle of July. Throughout the outdoor season, we were able to hold 33 uh, meets with very strict limitations on the size of the meets. Most of them were under 100. The max was probably close to 150. And in a normal year, we would normally have had over 70 sanctioned events with much bigger fields, including four provincial championships that would normally range from between 800 to 1200 athletes. So obviously it was a quite different world that we were in. We also managed to do some modified programs for young disadvantaged youth at, um, at a boys and girls club in the Jane Finch area and several other GTA camp programs that uh, we wouldn't normally have done. Um, but we were able to do this um, through cooperation with some of the community folks. Uh, and it was incredibly well received. The kids just loved having us there and we're just excited to be able to do something. So it was, um, it was a really uh, wonderful and inspiring opportunity. After the outdoor season, we then um, came into the cross country season. And that basically started in mid-September. Once again, the schools had canceled all their um, fall sports programs. So we became a very um, uh, needed um, uh, program to help uh, get the kids out there. We were able to hold eight very small cross country events across various locations in the province. These were very different than the normal cross country events in that we had to eliminate all mass starts. We used stagger starts. You can see in the, um, in the pictures above um, it, this uh, particular event, which was uh, one of our championships, we had racers starting um, um, basically six feet apart, two at a time and uh, five seconds apart. The first event that we ran, we actually started with um, individual people starting at 15 seconds apart. Um, and then we, over time, through uh, holding some of the meets, came down with what was most efficient and practical and, um, and was still um, worthwhile. In addition to this, what we also did was we, we started the runners based on their um, seed time. So we started the fastest runners first and the slowest runners last. So there would be um, very minimal passing on the course. And so it, um, it worked out really well. Um, we were able to hold um, a tri-region championship that was in the Brockville, March, Markham and London um, areas to help avoid travel issues. And between those three locations, we were able to have approximately 1,200 athletes participate on the same weekend in three locations over two days. Normally, we would have only had about 1,000 participants in one location on one day. So it was actually a huge success because we were able to split it across um, areas. And um, to support the schools, we also ran 12, 12 weeks with three sessions per week of after school online run jump throw programs through our Zoom platform. And on any given session, there would be anywhere from six to 14 kids participating. Uh, this, was, this program was not only a big hit with the uh, kids, but also for the parents who got a 30 to 40 minute break from entertaining the kids that had, um, were normally cooped up indoors. And um, throughout the outdoor track and cross country seasons, we had over 2000 competitors compete um, with zero reported cases of, um, of COVID transmission occurring at any of the events. 
into the indoor season. Right after our last championships in mid-November, which actually almost didn't happen due to wave two COVID surges. In fact, we had to move our cross country um, championships locations four times as different municipalities were shutting, were shutting down all permit activities due to the sur surge in cases. And so with the advent of, the, of our normal indoor season came the second um, big lockdown where at one point uh, we were not only we were not allowed to train in groups larger than that first 10, that went to then five, and then only people from the same household. So you can imagine, um, uh, I'm sure all of you remember those times just after Christmas where it was um, quite bleak. And uh, I don't think uh, you could argue that it was about the deepest, darkest period of um, winter that uh, there ever was. And, and about this time, the government came forward with exemptions for any athlete that was identified by their national sport body as training for the Olympics. For athletics, this, this was about 300 athletes across the entire country, with quite a few of them already training down in the US on a regular basis. We were able to hold very small modified meets for Olympians that were trying to attain the Olympic qualification standards during the indoor um, timeframe. At no time were we allowed to have more than 10 people in the entire building. We leveraged the um, Toronto Track and Field Centre, which is up at York University in Toronto. And if anybody knows that facility, you'll, you'll recognize just how large it is. Um, there's actually a 100 meter straightaway in there with a 200 meter oval beside it. So it is quite a large facility. And we were only allowed 10 people in that building, um, which included all of the officials. In, um, in one meet, uh, the very first meet we had, we had two competitors in one race. That was the entire meet. And I'm really happy to say that those two individuals both made their first Olympic teams in the women's eight and the women's 1500. So we were really pleased and, and, and proud to be able to support our Olympians in that way. Um, but it was a whole other world for, um, for the um, non-elite athletes. Through the eight events that we held indoors, we had approximately 40 different individuals compete um, as compared to a normal indoor season of, of about 12 events and over 2000 individual athletes. So you can see quite a different um, year. Then moving forward to the outdoor season. Outdoor started with a focus on the high performance programs uh, in May. Uh, most of the programs were still in lockdown with the exception of the elite athletes exemptions. We were able to hold five high performance meets with our Olympic hopefuls leading up to the Olympic trials. And um, really, really happy and proud of our Ontario athletes. They um, made up 60% of the, of the team were from Ontario and uh, they brought home four of the six Canadian medals in athletics as well as um, all but one person on the bronze medal team was from Ontario. And, and that bronze medal team, we're hopeful will soon be a silver medal with the uh, preliminary disqualification of the team from um, Great Britain. A really um, cool stat that we, um, we shared recently um, is that uh, Canada placed eighth overall in the medal count. And um, that's pretty significant considering we're ahead of countries like Great Britain, Germany, and Australia, which um, uh, isn't often normal for, um, for Canada to be ahead of. So we did really, really well. And what's really interesting is that if Ontario had been a country, we would have placed ninth overall. So only one place different if we were um, um, a country. While the Olympics were going on, the rest of the province opened up into stage one then stage two and quickly into stage three, which gave us um, some more flexibility to train and hold competitions. Next slide. We were then able to actually host this year some very modified championships, but they were championships. And um, we were able to um, um, make that happen by separating out our age groups to keep the numbers down a bit. This meant having seven, seven championship events from ages um, uh, U, U8 all the way up to our masters with a 90 plus athlete um, competing. 
on a normal year, we would have three to four championships. So needless to say, the, the AO team was running flat out every week between um, the second week of July until, um, until the 1st of September. And with only eight staff, um, I can tell you the team was exhausted, um, but um, they, uh, they made it through. The main difference between the 2021 and 2020 um, outdoors was um, we were able to have um, 300 participants in the facility at any given time, as opposed to the 100 person limit that we had um, had been um, dealing with the previous summer. We were also allowed a limited number of spectators in the facilities, whereas in 2020, no spectators were allowed inside the track facility at all. Um, and at this point, we still have no reported cases resulting from um, any AO event, and we um, hope to keep it, um, keep it that way. So moving forward, now we're just starting into our cross-country season, second COVID cross-country season. So far, we have um, um, eight events on the calendar with other locations still being explored. We have um, our provincial championships currently scheduled for mid-November in Kingston. It will be a um, single location um, over two days instead of a single location. The national championships this year are, we're lucky enough, are going to be in, in Ottawa. So it's a bonus for Ontario athletes because we won't have to um, travel outside the province, get on planes, planes, trains, et cetera. So that's great for us. And that will be um, uh, late November. And then the really most important thing that um, is coming out is the recent changes that we have announced um, for our um, new vaccine um, mandate. And, and uh, uh, the board um, uh, has uh, done a lot of uh, soul searching and research and um, determining the best path forward to, um, to mitigate uh, risk. And they've decided that um, not only will we um, follow the, uh, obviously we have to support the province's mandate for uh, indoors proof of vaccination, um, but we will be requiring it for all of our track and cross country events outdoors um, for all ages 12 and older, um, not just for the 18 plus age groups. And that, um, that actually starts this weekend with our first um, cross country event, which is our, um, a master's cross country event up in, um, up in Aurora. So um, we um, are anticipating a, uh, a great season and um, we know that uh, there'll be lots of changes coming and our board is very closely monitoring the system, the situation and um, again, we'll make any changes as they deem appropriate based on um, what's happening uh, in our world. So that's where we are. Thank you. Okay, I'm coming back on here. Thank you so much, Paul. That was amazing. I really appreciate all the, the work that you've done with uh, Athletics Ontario and the great uh, results that you've had um, during the pandemic and, and, and moving forward. That's fantastic. Good for you. Congratulations on all of those and especially being able to meet the needs of our um, uh, Olympians to qualify for Tokyo and, and the great work that was done there. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like to pose a couple of questions that we received in advance um, in our q and A. I I don't know if you've seen any of the questions there. I don't think there's any uh, currently, but um, this probably goes to all of you, uh, this first question, if you don't mind. Uh, we originally had it uh, posed to public health, but I think all of you should have a chance to answer this. It says, who's responsible for enforcing the Ontario return to play guidelines in places like parks and sport fields. And part two of that is what enforcement tools do you have in place um, in order to, uh, sorry, let, would they, okay. What, what enforcement tools do you have at your disposal or in place to deal with any infractions? Okay, so if you, who wants to go first, anybody? 
Special. So maybe Helen, I can start and just frame it in the context of City of Hamilton response to some of these complaints um, that might be reopening Ontario specific and then I'll look to Laura to Steve to um, frame any additional commentary from their end um, as well. So locally here in the City of Hamilton our municipal law enforcement and bylaw enforcement colleagues would, would be the lead enforcement agency for reopening Ontario Act compliance. Um, so they would be the ones visiting uh, in response to complaints to sports fields and places like that to address any complaints or um, proactively respond to any um, compliance issues that they may become aware of. So for us locally here in the city, we're lucky to have our municipal law enforcement and bylaw colleagues take the lead on that work. When we talk about enforcement tools like like our approach for enforcement at the city, it's always an education first approach and trying to gain compliance, voluntary compliance with the reopening Ontario Act and those associated um, requirements there. If there's local municipal bylaws also at play around physical distancing and masking, it's education, and then working through that progressive enforcement lens that may involve additional um, actions such as laying of charges against the individual. I'll turn it to Laura and Steve to ask if they have additional commentary from their end uh, that they want to provide. Thanks, Ashwin. I can uh, jump in and if Laura, if I missed anything, we can jump in as well. I, I think uh, being proactive is is one of those key aspects that we try to uh, try to, to look at as well. Uh, you know, we've talked about a number of times that you know we we are partners within the sport community uh, as municipalities and as facility owners. Um, you know, we work alongside with our sport organizations, and and I, I think it's important to have that cooperation in that sense as well. Obviously. If from a technical standpoint, uh, you know, our municipal law enforcement are the ones that have the authority to, to uh, provide uh, that enforcement piece, but it's really important that we are working together. We are working as a partnership and um, sessions like this, um, you know, I've talked about in the past, if we do find an issue uh, with a particular sport organization, uh, again, we'll take it upon ourselves to have that discussion with that leadership uh, of that sport organization. And, and typically, they have been cooperative. You know, um, it's really sometimes um, individual coaches or parents that really need further education. But I can tell you from more, um, more often than not, our sport organizations have been great partners in, in making sure that we uh, comply and, and have that mutual cooperation in that sense. Good. So am I hearing, um, just to clarify that, and, and it, just to follow up with, uh, with what Latchman said as well. Um, so does someone have to, um, place a complaint first before uh, by law enforcement comes out to check to see and to, uh, you know, give them the, the uh, sort of a warning and the educational piece or, and, or who do they pass it on to after that? Like what happens first? Is it, is it a, a, a complaint that needs to be lodged first by a parent or a bystander or a spectator or an athlete or what? So uh, Helen, my understanding right now of reinforcement approach is that it is um, in, in response to complaints and inquiries made by the public that will generate those actions. Um, when we've looked at other rollouts of the regulation, there has been um, enforcement related blitzes or campaigns done to promote compliance and those things are are not complaint driven they're more engaging with a particular setting where there might be a high risk or just um, new regulations pertaining to a new setting that um, might present an opportunity for education and follow up on on ensuring that there the understanding of requirements are in place but currently my understanding and we can take this back to our bylaw colleagues would be if we do get a complaint our bylaw colleagues would respond to it okay okay thank you from a, from, a, from my perspective, um, Helen, I could just I could just share um, anecdotally um, last year when when things were really heated up, um, and a lot of us were training in the parks because they were they were very open. And I can recall that there was lots of times when there would be parks people that would be walking around. Usually, they would be very identifiable with um, some of their uh, 
um, colored vests that uh, made them very um, um, you know, visible. And I can tell you just the presence um, help to keep people um, doing the right thing, doing the social distancing and other stuff. And so um, I didn't see a lot of um, enforcement as much as I just saw um, that uh, kind of um, just presence. And to Steve's point about, um, you know, working closely with the, um, with the sports organizations, we work very closely with all of our sports organizations to remind them of the um, policies and, and, uh, and our members were pretty good at coming to us if they saw um, other groups um, not obeying, and then and then we would go and have conversations with them. So it wasn't an enforcement uh, strictly, but it was certainly an education that we uh, that we did there. Oh, that's great! Thank you for that. That's uh, good information, and I think that's that's uh, a positive way to uh, respond to our sport organizations because you don't want to shut them down; you want them to be educated and to continue in a safe manner. I think that's that's a good way to approach it. Another question we had was about vaccines. And I, I think Laura really covered it really, really well in terms of the vaccine verification process. A couple of people asked if um, one of the questions on, uh, on the chat was, uh, or in the Q&A is also about, is a photocopy or a photo on your cell phone okay? And I think that's, what you said, yes, that would be acceptable to show as a verification. Um, another question was um, for the outdoor settings. How do you how do you enforce the verification of the vaccine in outdoor settings? So vaccine verification is only for indoor recreation facilities, so it does not apply outdoors. And we encourage sport groups to keep training outdoors for as long as possible, and and therefore, you know, reducing some of those barriers for their athletes, uh, but not required outdoors. So I'll answer from um, from right. our perspective because yeah. we are requiring outdoors at our cross country and um, track meets, and in those cases. Um, it's a very controlled environment because all the participants have to register in advance. And uh, so they will first of all indicate that they, um, um, that they have been vaccinated. And then when they show up, they will simply, they have to um, um, show up to get their bib number or race number before they can compete. And when they um, show up to get that bib number, they'll show their proof of, um, of vaccination. And then they will be given their bib and can and can then compete. So that's how we'll manage it from an outdoor perspective. And again, it's a very very controlled environment because it's not just a free for all. It's uh, people coming um, that have already registered in advance. Important clarification, Paul. That although the uh, regulations don't require it outdoors, your governing body, who ensures your athletes, who set your return to play plan, may require it, even though there's an exemption. Uh, exactly. So it's it's that coordinated approach and what Steve covered of the hierarchy. So it's balancing all those requirements. Yes, and you can go above what the requirements are according to the sport organization. Yes, I see that. And we yeah. have seen a number of provincial bodies uh, having the 12 plus athletes required to be vaccinated and they're making those decisions as part of, uh, you know, related to insurance or a best practice within their sport. Okay, thank you for that clarification. There was another part of this question too that says has uh, Athletics Canada and or Athletics Ontario considered how um, the vaccine mandates for outdoors could impact uh, particularly um, uh, Black athletes, coaches, and the broader Black community, because um, some, um, there are some hesitancy in terms of getting the vaccine just due to structural racism and some medical distrust in, the, in those particular communities in some areas. Uh, is there any consideration to that? Yeah, thanks, Helen. And, and this is a really obviously tough, tough um, conversation that we that we've had already with our with our members. And athletics, by the nature of the sport, is probably one of the most racially diverse sports there is out there because it's so open and accessible to all to achieve. So this is very very close to um, to us. And um, you know, this ultimately comes down to an issue of of trust and fear. And we really need to be open to really listening to people's concerns and fears and, and to not judge them um, around this. Uh, these conversations aren't easy, but they are important um, 
um, to ensure when it feels that their voices have been heard. And two weeks ago, we had um, an initial conversation on one of our town hall meetings, and we surveyed the attendees on implementing a vaccine policy for not only the indoor activities, but also our outdoor track and cross country events. And we had 70% of the members on the call supporting such a policy. Um, but based on the input from that town hall um, meeting, um, we surveyed our entire membership base after that. And the results again came back with um, approximately 70% supporting the expanded um, vaccine mandate. Um, and that's when the um, AO board um, then implemented the current policy. And I can tell you that um, you know, it's not done there. Just this afternoon, we had a very open um, but very civil conversation um, on our town hall that we had today uh, with a number of members, some who strongly oppose the AO vaccine policy, some who they're just unsure that whether it's appropriate or not, and some who strongly support the current policy. So it was quite a, um, a wide open conversation. And as I'd mentioned earlier, the, the board is continuing to monitor the situation and, and it will revise our policy if they believe it's necessary to revise. At the end of the day, the board's job is to provide oversight and direction of all major risks that face the organization. And you know, just like parents that sometimes have to make tough decisions, um, they have to implement policies that they feel will best reduce the, uh, the most risk to all members. Uh, personally, I have to say that this is actually um, this is an issue that I am very aware of and actually currently dealing in my own personal life. I have uh, myself two biracial girls. I've got one who's vaccinated and one who's not vaccinated. My unvaccinated daughter acknowledges you know, the very real threat and risk of COVID, but she's also very afraid of the vaccine. Uh, at this point, she's chosen not to get vaccinated. Uh, and this has resulted in some personal conflicts in dealing with um, her family as her cousin um, who is pregnant um, at this time and they're, and they're very close. Uh, it's just not comfortable being around her um, even, though, even though her cousin is vaccinated. My, my daughter fully understands and respects this decision. And um, not only um, does she always in advance tell people that she's not vaccinated and if they don't want her to be there, she won't show up and she's okay with that. Um, and uh, uh, she wears a mask everywhere. She's, she is very, very much afraid of contracting COVID. So this is not somebody who is you know, very against the whole thing. She's just very afraid and this fear is very real. So we have to be very open to listening and, but still doing what um, we feel is in the best interest of the overall membership. Oh, good. Thank you for sharing that. That's very personal information there, but Thank you. I think that uh, helps a lot, and I and I hope people can respect that uh, uh, decision that has been made by uh, AO for sure. Uh, I don't see any further questions. Uh, if anyone out there, I, I know we've lost a few people over the night, but everyone's getting a copy of this recording who registered. So you'll have a, a huge audience, even though they might not be here right now. Uh, a lot of people will be seeing this at some point in time. Uh, again, I would like to thank all of the panelists. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Like I said, you, you all have a very busy schedule and I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, answer our questions and provide such valuable information. So thank you. And to the people out there that did um, tune in tonight, thank you so much for doing that. And to those who are registered as well, everyone will be receiving a short survey um, It'll be emailed out to you along with a link to this recording so that uh, if you wouldn't mind filling that out so we can better prepare, or not even better prepare, but add more things that you might be um, willing to hear and, and see on our next webinars. Also, if you wouldn't mind uh, tuning into our Sport Hamilton website for more information, more resources, uh, copies of previous webinars and uh, valuable links, go to www.sporthamilton.com. And also if you're a sport organization or club based in the Hamilton area, if you have any of your athletes or teams that have won a provincial championship or competed at the national or international level in 2021, 
please register for the and be recognized at the annual breakfast of champions. The deadline for everyone to uh, give us that information is November the 1st. Uh, you can just register by emailing info at sporthamilton.com and that's all you need to do. So please do that to make sure everyone gets recognized, especially if you're in the cross country championships or the outdoor AO championships. Uh, we'd really like to be able to recognize you. I'd like to say thanks to Brent Smith in the background who helped produce all of this tonight. And also I'd like to thank my uh, vice president Val Sargent who did a lot of the heavy lifting to get this uh, whole thing together and I appreciate everybody's help. So uh, thank you everybody for tuning in and especially to our panelists and uh, good night everybody. Thanks Helen. Thank you. Thank you.